This is Unsung History, the podcast where we discuss people and events in American history that haven't always received a lot of attention. I'm your host, Kelly Therese Pollack. I'll start each episode with a brief introduction to the topic and then talk to someone who knows a lot more than I do. Be sure to subscribe to Unsung History on your favorite podcasting app so you never miss an episode. And please, Tell your friends, family, neighbors, colleagues, maybe even strangers to listen to. Today's topic is the 1966 riot at Compton's Cafeteria. Compton's Cafeteria was part of a small San Francisco chain owned by a man named Gene Compton from the 1940s to the 1970s. This particular Compton's cafeteria was located in the Tenderloin District of San Francisco and had opened in 1954 at 101 Taylor Street, which was at the intersection of Taylor and Turk. In 1966, Compton's cafeteria was open 24 hours a day, making it as much a meeting place as a restaurant trans sex workers, who were not welcome in gay bars at the time, met up at Compton's in the late night and early morning hours, socializing and checking up on each other. Their work was often perilous. Compton's management was not supportive of their trans customers, and they would often call the police on them. Female impersonation and cross-dressing were illegal at the time, so the cops could arrest the trans women and drag queens just for being themselves. Many trans women turned to sex work because they were marginalized and discriminated against in other professions. Those who could pass as women could sometimes find employment in office work, but their identification cards would often out them in the employment process, keeping them from being hired. Except for those who could sing or dance, many others ended up on the streets. Sex workers faced the constant threat of violence from both their clients and from the police. For a time, a serial killer operating in the Tenderloin targeted trans sex workers. Sex reassignment surgery was not yet widely available. Most Americans didn't even know such surgery was possible until American Christine Jorgensen traveled to Copenhagen, Denmark in 1952 for surgery. Upon her return to the U.S., Her story was published in the New York Daily News, and she became something of a celebrity. One of Jorgensen's doctors, Dr. Harry Benjamin, published a book called The Transsexual Phenomenon in 1966. And in the same year, he opened a practice in San Francisco, not far from the Tenderloin. It was around this same time in 1965, that the first known gay youth organization in the U.S. was founded. Vanguard started in the Tenderloin, and many of the trans sex workers joined. In June 1966, the radical ministers at Glide Memorial Church, a progressive church in the neighborhood, started to sponsor the work of Vanguard. Vanguard held meetings in the church basement, but another place that they often met to organize was at Compton's Cafeteria. Until, that is, they were kicked out for loitering without buying anything. Vanguard had for several months been picketing small businesses that wouldn't serve LGBTQ youth. And on July 19, 1966, they picketed Compton's Cafeteria. The picket ultimately wasn't successful, 
but it was written up in the local newspaper and had a lasting impact. In August 1966, everything reached a boiling point. On a hot weekend night, the exact date is lost to history. An employee at Compton's called the police, claiming that some of the trans customers were being rowdy. The police arrived and started to arrest one of the women. But this time, when they grabbed her, she threw hot coffee in a cop's face. That act of resistance set off a riot, with customers throwing plates and silverware, even furniture, at the cops and at the windows of the cafeteria, and hitting police with high-heeled shoes and purses. The cops retreated to the street, and the riot followed them, damaging a police car and burning a newsstand. The police fought back, using what one police officer later called unnecessary violence as they arrested the rioters. The next day, a crowd showed up to picket when Compton's would no longer allow trans people to enter. Once again, the windows were smashed. After the riot, Compton's established a midnight closing time. But business dwindled, and the cafeteria closed for good in 1972. The Compton's riot didn't spark a national movement the way Stonewall would three years later. But it did have an effect. In 1968, the National Transsexual Counseling Unit was established, providing peer-run support services for the community. The city of San Francisco started to take seriously the needs of the trans community, and over time, police harassment and brutality lessened. Joining me now to discuss the riot, its causes, and its aftermath is historian Dr. Susan Stryker, co-writer and co-director of the Emmy-winning 2005 documentary Screaming Queens, The Riot at Compton's Cafeteria, and author of several books, including Transgender History. Welcome, Susan. Thank you so much for speaking with me today. Yeah, it's really great to be here, Kelly. Yeah, so I am uh, just delighted to be learning about the Compton's Cafeteria Riots, something that I didn't know a whole lot about um, before. And I, I noticed as I was watching your documentary, you used the word unsung. And I was like, aha, perfect for this unsung history podcast. So I would love to start by uh, hearing a little bit about how you learned about this story uh, and started to, to get into researching it. Sure. It's a story, gosh, about 30 years in the making at this point that I was just finishing up my PhD in U.S. history at UC Berkeley. I was transitioning uh, as a trans person um, right at the end of my PhD process. I, you know, to not put too fine a point on it, had a snowball's chance in hell of getting an academic job right at that particular point in history. And, but, you know, I needed to transition for my own reasons. And I just thought, well, you know, I'm trained as a historian. I'm not going into the academy right now. It's like, let me get busy doing community-based historical work. And uh, my my, um, my dissertation work had not been in history of sexuality and gender that, you know, was long enough ago that that really wasn't considered something one did yet. And so I thought, well, you know, like, let me, let me like look into trans history, you know, it's like since I've kind of living at 24-7-365. And you know, I, I just thought, well, let me let me just get involved with the 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 gay and lesbian historical society, which is a community-based um, archive and historical society. Um, I started volunteering, I learned how to become an archivist, and I just kind of spent my days in the archive, you know, nosing around. And I found a document that that described, it was actually written in 1972. 
that was describing this riot that had happened in San Francisco in 1966. That document was actually the program for the first gay pride parade in San Francisco, which was in 1972. And the program basically said, you know, to synopsize it, it was like, you know, hey, y'all, we're, you know, here to, you know, commemorate the Stonewall Rebellion in New York in 1969. But don't forget, gay liberation started in San Francisco three years earlier in 1966. It all began one hot August night at the corner of Turk and Taylor Streets and the CD Tenderloin neighborhood, you know, where the drag queens and hair fairies and hustlers were, you know, sitting around, you know, the tables in the middle of the night and the cops came in to do their usual job of harassing them. But that night, you know, they did not, you know, go willingly into the paddy wagons and and, you know, sort of the rest is history, you know, that they said a queen threw a cup of coffee in a cop's face, all hell broke loose. You know, there was fighting, you know, inside Compton's, you know, the windows were smashed out. People poured into the streets from the surrounding bars and SRO hotels. There were the police were pouring in. And, you know, I, I now have better um documentation from eyewitnesses to the event who were there. It's like, and it was a big deal. It's like there were, there were reliable estimates of several hundred people in the streets and, you know, dozens and dozens of police cars and that uh, it wasn't just a one night event. I mean, there was the, the spark that went off that erupted but there were there was you know, continuing agitation uh, at the intersection of Turk and Taylor Streets, where this Compton's cafeteria was located, uh, that went on for a few days. And that it is kind of amazing to me that something that was that significant kind of sank without a trace. You know, we remember Stonewall. Why don't we remember Compton's? Yeah. So I want to get back to that question, but I want to hear about the detective work that you did. I mean, that, that's essentially what you had to do to, to figure out what happened from this little snippet to, to find anything and, and to reconstruct this story. So, so how did you pursue that? Uh, for a very long time. <laughs> that's, <basically, laughs> that's, that's, that's the, the, the easy answer. You know, I, I found the document that described the thing. And I thought, well, is it even true? You know, it's just like written in 72 about something that had happened earlier. And I thought, was this, you know, a local activist exaggerating? Was it some kind of like East Coast, West Coast rivalry? It's kind of like, you know, yo, East Coast, you know, <laughs> you got Stonewall. So we've got Compton's. We were here first. You know, I, you know, I, I, I had no idea, you know, what, what it was. And my first thought was to go look at police records, you know, it's like, well, you know, like, let's go to the city archives and um, find police records from August of 1966. I asked the city archivist for those records and her words were, I quote, it's like, those records have been disappeared. And I said, what? And she said, yeah, you know, it's like people think about San Francisco as this, you know, progressive or leftist place, but you know, the 60s it's like there was a war going on it's like you know the sort of the old power structure and the you know ethnic white you know irish italian greek cops on the force they didn't like all those dang hippies with their long hair and love beads uh, and those anti-war protesters and those like psychedelic countercultural people and that you know there was there was a war going on and um the cops lost ultimately. It's like San Francisco became something else in the 70s, you know, or by the 70s, it had become something than it had been when the 60s rolled around. And, you know, the the old um, sort of more conservative power structure was out. And um, according to the city archivist, just vast amounts of police records were disappeared because they just didn't want evidence of any kind of misconduct. And that's like, there's no, no record. It's like, Oh, let me go to the newspapers. And there was no mention in the newspapers there. And, you know, and as I've thought about it since then, as I pieced the story together more, I really do think it has to do with that question of, you know, the cops got their ass kicked by, you know, street Queens and they it it was it was just not talked about 
the mainstream press did not cover it. The mainstream press had been covering weeks and months of escalating police crackdowns in the Tenderloin. I mean, raids on drag bars and, you know, uh, sex work venues um, as the war in Vietnam was escalating and there were more uh, service members uh, passing through San Francisco on their way to Vietnam, you know, the military police crackdowns, like all of that was reported. I mean, you can, you can see retrospectively, you can see this like escalating pattern of violence targeting trans people in the tenderloin. Uh, but no mention of the riot, even in the queer press, you know, the, the gay and lesbian press, no mention. There was mention of a queer youth group called Vanguard that had been organizing in the Tenderloin, had been at Compton's. They kind of hung out there. That's where they held their meetings. You know, th th there was plenty of coverage of community organizing in the Tenderloin um, because there was a, a neighborhood campaign going on right at that time to um, uh, to qualify the neighborhood for anti-poverty funding through the war on poverty. You know, plenty of reporting about all of that, about how the pot is getting stirred. But did they talk about the denizens of this late night cafeteria, like kicking butt? Nope. And I think part of what was going on there is that around the same time that violence was, you know, coming down on people and it was being resisted in the tenderloin, there was the first big national homophile uh, convention, like this group of more, uh, I would say, accommodationist, you know, more, I don't want to use the word conservative, because I think what they were doing was actually quite important, but uh, gay and lesbian groups were more interested in a kind of respectability politics. Mm -hmm. uh, there was this big national meeting of different homophile organizations from around the country happening in San Francisco in August. It was called 10 Days in August. And I think the respectable gays just like did not want to talk about the gender trash out there in the streets. I think I really think that is what was going on. So there are many reasons why I think it it fell between the cracks. But, you know, I, I thought, well, then how am I going to find out if this thing actually happens? And, uh, you know, like I said, a moment ago, I was working, <clears throat> volunteering, spending much of my time in the archive of the GLBT Historical Society. I think I read the entire archive, you know, <laughs> uh, I think I feel you know, like I looked through all of the periodical publications, the newspapers, the ephemera files, organizational records, people's personal records. I was just deeply, deeply, deeply familiarizing myself in San Francisco's queer history. And anytime I saw anything about trans whatever, or about the tenderloin, or about Compton's, just like I was, I would photocopy it, I'd stick it in a folder. And I just kept, you know, this is back, you know, before, before the interwebs, <laughs> you know, it was still a very analog way of doing, doing history. And over time, you know, I just kept finding little puzzle pieces. It's like, oh, this looks like a piece that fits into the puzzle that I'm looking for. Oh, this looks like a piece. And just it was just very gradual that I I built up what I thought of as um you know a plausible story for how it looked like hmm, actually looks like it could have happened. The other piece I will say that that turned out to be really important for me is that um, there was another volunteer at the historical society who uh, was a geographer and who entered like all of these like addresses for like where gay bars and organizations had been and fed it into an early um, um, mapping software. And it's like, all of a sudden, it's like, you could do like, where were the gay bars in 1940, 1950, 1960, 1970. And I got this like spatial sense of like, oh my God, look, it's like all of these SRO hotels that catered mostly to trans people. They're all clustered right around Turk and Taylor. It's like all of these like sex work bars are like right around there. It's like all of these places that were central in the lives of trans people, unhoused youth, street hustlers, you know, all, it's like all it's like it Compton's was at the crossroads of that neighborhood. And then I was able to to put in kind of what I knew just as a, 
you know, formally academically trained U.S. historian, it's like I knew some of the social movement history. It's like I knew some of the major political events that were going on. And it's just the more I thought about the, the bigger context, the more and more it made sense. It's like, you know, it's like that that event, it's like it just totally makes sense for its time and place. And then once I kind of had that story, I went out, started doing oral history. I started, you know, and I, for the longest time, could not find anybody who was um, a firsthand, you know, witness or participant. I mean, I did find this like trans woman of color who was incarcerated in a men's prison who I was told used to be a cook at Compton's, but California prisons, it's like they, um, you know, they, they, there's a media blackout. You couldn't interview the prisoners and she wound up dying in prison before we could ever interview her, you know? So, you know, which I just think is, is indicative of the kind of necro political violence that lands so heavily on trans feminine people, particularly trans feminine people of, of color. It's like, they just were not alive to be interviewed. So my Kind of after I had what I thought of as like a plausible scenario, a preponderance of evidence, I wanted to tell the story in public, um, and I I decided that I wanted to make a film about it. And part of that was feeling like this is a really important story. It's like it is like a Stonewall like riot before Stonewall. It is an event that clearly centers the lives of trans people who are you know, active in sex work. It is very clearly um, uh, a kind of anti-carceral, you know, moment of mass resistance. And I thought, you know, I don't want to bury this in a history journal someplace, you know, it's just like, I, I don't want to write an article about it. I don't want to write a monograph. I want to tell the story in public. And so let's make a film and let's make a film for public television because at the time, you know, remember this is the 90s, that was the way to like reach the most people for the, you know, for free. So I had a good friend uh, actually from grad school who was also interested in filmmaking and we started applying for grants and we got some grant money and Screaming Queens was the result. I think the very act of publicly saying that you're making a film about something can become a part of the recovery process and the educational process, because we, we started doing work in progress screenings at community groups. It's like just sort of talking the project up, asking people for information and that we were initially thinking that we would structure the film as kind of like a paper chase, you know, that it would be you know, Susan Stryker, trans historian, like trying to figure <laughs> out the truth of the Commons cafeteria, right? It did it really happen. It's like, what's that city archivist? Those records have been disappeared. Where will we go next? You know, for our information, and that we would wind up saying no smoking gun, but a preponderance of evidence. And if it happened, it would have happened just like this. And then we would do a recreation reenactment. But when we started telling the story in public, people started coming forward. You know, it's like somebody was you know, one of the interviewees in the film, uh, Felicia Elizondo, uh, she, she like called me the next day. I didn't know her at the time. She called me the next day and she says, you need to talk to Amanda. It's like, Amanda was there. You know, it's like, Amanda's told me that story before. It's just like, you know, you need to talk to Amanda. It's like, okay. And we found one of the you know, principal witnesses. It's like this woman, Amanda St. James, who's featured in the film, who was there, you know, and, and, you know, I thought, mm, this is complicated. It's like, I don't want to lead her too much. I don't want to yeah. like suggest things that then she'll just say back to me like, oh yeah, that's totally right. I was there. Didn't tell her much of anything. I just asked her these very broad questions. I said, so like, I heard there was a riot at Compton's cafeteria. And she was like, oh yes, honey. And like, and she just starts telling it to me. <laughs> and it's like, and it was the story that I had pieced together. You know, and to me, that felt like such, you know, such a great corroboration of the archival sleuthing and of the, you know, the spatial analysis of the urban geography and everything just kind of kept lining up. And in the years since we've made the film, it's like I've now found more people um, who have filled in additional 
gaps and holes and what I was able to piece together. And it's like, yup, Compton's Cafeteria Riot. August 1966, probably the, I'm going to forget the exact date, probably August 27th. We don't know the exact date, but circumstantial evidence suggests it was probably the last Saturday of the month. So yeah, it's a thing. Yeah. I'm so glad that the the film you ended up making does include those women that you talked to uh, in part because It tells such a vibrant story, not just of the riot itself, but of what life was like then, what sort of led up to that. Can you talk some about that sort of what what the Tenderloin was like for these trans women, the, the kinds of lives they were leading, trying to lead, you know, in this lead up to the riot? The Tenderloin, I think of it as a containment zone. It is a carceral organization of space. It is the part of the city that is set aside for tacitly allowed criminalized activities. It's a red light district. It's where gambling would take place. It's where drug dealing happened. It's where you had after hours entertainment venues. It's where the brothels were. It's where the drag clubs were. And, you know, so it was, it was the, um, you know, so-called vice tourism district. You know, the, the, the idea of a tenderloin is not something that's unique to San Francisco. It's like most U.S. cities of any size in the 19th and 20th centuries had a tenderloin district. Um, the term actually started as a name for just such a district in New York City, but that other cities would then talk about their tenderloin. San Francisco is the only city I know of uh, where that place name stuck. It's still called the Tenderloin. Used to be a more generic word. Now it's just downtown San Francisco. But what, what I think is really important to note is that most people could come in and out of the Tenderloin, you know, that it was like, it was like like a vice tourism. It's like, you know, you live out in the suburbs, you want to like, score some heroin it's like you know you can go to the tenderloin it's like you you know buy your balloon you know you get your nickel bag and then you know you go home or you want to go pub crawling bar hopping it's like you come in you do it you leave it's like you're looking for you know commercial sex it's like you go there you find it you pay your you know your your worker and then you go home to you know wife and kids but for trans women Because of employment discrimination, it's like most trans women could not find work in, um, you know, the so-called legitimate economy. It's like they were consigned to like gray market, you know, and criminalized black market activities. Uh, So they worked in the tenderloin and they, they were often not allowed to live anywhere else. If you were visibly trans, it's like people wouldn't rent to you. Uh, And there were all of these hotels in the Tenderloin. At one point, there were like 10 or 12 SRO hotels that had mostly trans women living in them. I've seen estimates at the time of there being a, a, a trans population in the Tenderloin in the 1960s of around 300, 300, 400 people. Um, there were also, the other thing I would want to say is that the Tenderloin at the time was largely white, but that there were other like venues for trans sex work and other, um, ethnic enclaves and the mostly Latinx mission or around Chinatown or in some of the predominantly black neighborhoods, but that you would have, um, trans women who lived in those neighborhoods coming into the tenderloin to do to do sex work so it was the 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 tenderloin was many kinds of ghettos but it was very specifically a trans sex work ghetto uh, that was created through corrupt policing that you know the cops kept tacitly tolerated criminalized activities in that location you know it's like fish in a barrel uh, they often profited from it in a corrupt way of taking bribes and kickbacks, you know, not raiding um, Madam's house in exchange for a cut of the profits or not raiding the bar if the bar owner paid them off. So 
so yeah, you know, that those were the conditions that um, trans women were living in in the 1960s. And they were, you know, they were re- regarded by and large as like the, you know, below the bottom rung of the ladder. You know, one of the interviewees in the films is like, we were the gutter girls. You know, and that police thought they could abuse trans people with impunity. You know, it's like I, people tell stories in the film and, you know, I heard other stories that didn't make it into the film of, you know, basically one, as one of our interviewees says, it's like the cops would walk into the bar and say, you, 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 and you come with us, you know, where they would tell stories of, um, of, you know, being driven around in the backseat of a police car all over the city for hours of, um, you know, police officers, like forcing them to give them blowjobs and the patrol cars, they would like, you know, take them to jail. They would like, you know, strip them and parade them in front of the other prisoners. They would shave their heads. I mean, it's just like, it was just, it was just straight up abuse. And, you know, like th- those are the conditions that feed into a riot. Yeah. 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 So, you know, my, my question as a historian was like, well, these kinds of these forms of oppression that trans women were living under, it's like they were systemic and structural and, and, you know, ongoing. Why, you know, it's like, why on this night, you know, of all nights, you know, why, why did they, why did they riot one night? And I, I wanted to think about that in the storytelling in the, in the film of, um, you know, trying to provide some, you know, some, some explanations for why, why then, you know, rather than some other time. And I do think it has to do with the social mobilizations that were going on in the neighborhood. I mean, there were, you know, there, there, there was mobilization around accessing federal money for the anti-poverty programs. There was a lot of neighborhood-based activism trying to access that money there was there was actually kind of a deeper backstory than we were able to tell in the film but the watts riot in los angeles one of the major triggers for that was after president johnson had announced you know these you know these like federal community block grants through the you know the equal opportunity and employment commissions through the war on poverty programs that there were people who thought it's like, great, we're like going to get some money into our neighborhoods. But then at the city level, it's like city administrations would often like vacuum up that money for their, you know, political cronies and, you know, not necessarily direct it to where it most needed to go. And when that happened in Los Angeles, people in Watts are basically like, hell no. And, (laughs) you know, and, and then people in San Francisco were going like, you saw what happened in Watts. You don't want that to happen in San Francisco, do you? And the powers that be in the city were like, right. Uh, and there was a much more neighborhood-based campaign to like bring that federal money in to address local needs. But because of because of the way that poverty was thought of c- correctly as being uh, deeply linked to structural problems of racism that the neighborhoods that were organizing to access that money, it was the Bayview Hunters Point, uh, which was largely black Chinatown, the mission, which was, was, you know, Latinx neighborhood. And the Tenderloin was not part of the mix because it was largely white. Right. And so part of what I find actually quite inspiring about the community mobilization that was going on in the Tenderloin is that it was led largely by gay and lesbian people, as well as by um, progressive ministers at Glide Memorial Methodist Church. And that what you saw was mostly white queer people saying to like very political people of color, it's like, we see what your problem is. We have some of the same problems our problems are more related to being queer uh, than to being of color. But this big pie of federal money that's coming in, it's like in the name of justice, we need to split that five ways, not four ways, and we need to get our slice. And that's how it 
played out. I mean, there was, I, I think I call that in my book, Transgender History. It's like the first gay, straight, multiracial alliance for economic justice in U.S. history. You know, and that happened in the Tenderloin. It's a really, to my mind, it, um, extremely inspiring story. And, you know, without that kind of activism, community organizing, mobilization, it's just like, I don't know if the seeds would have been planted for the kind of resistance that happened. People were agitated, you know, it's like, you know, agitate, educate, organize, <laughs> right? There was agitation, there was organizing. And then when that, when the cops came in that one night, it's just like, it was different. It was different because the community was different. It was different because people had been organizing before the event, they were ready. And it's like, and the next time the police raid came in, boom, there was that hell no moment. Yeah. And part of what makes a difference then is what happens after. So you mentioned in transgender history, you know, there it's not the first time that anyone had ever resisted the police. Uh, there's Cooper Donuts in, in LA, and I think that was 1959. What makes this different is that there were actually things that came out of it, <laughs> that it wasn't just like a one-time thing and, and nothing happened. So can you talk some about that that piece of it, the the sort of repercussions of what happened? Yeah, you know, I, I do I do see the Compton's cafeteria riot as being the thing that put trans issues you know, on the map for the, you know, the powers that be in the city. It's like it was, you know, like there was a, a particular police officer, this guy Elliot Blackstone, who we profile in the film, who you know, he, and I said, and I have many criticisms of police departments and the way police forces work. Uh, and, you know, Elliot was, you know, somebody, he said, I think of myself as a social worker with a badge. And it's just like, I think, you know, laws shouldn't criminalize people for just like being who they are. It's like, if you're leaving people alone, people should leave you alone. You know, so he actually had this kind of, you know, not, not radical, but I would say liberal perspective on, um, you know, trying to decriminalize nonviolent crimes, you know, and it's like, why are we arresting like people for prostitution? Why are we arresting people for drugs? It's like, why are we arresting people for cross dressing? You know, it's just like, he really did have that, that mindset. And, you know, like he was like trying to get the police to stop doing like, you know, bathroom entrapment. He would, you know, do advocacy work on behalf of, you know, trans and gay people, you know, and, you know, like, you know, pretty cool. It's like he was like trying to change police practices in the city. Um, the city public health department started offering a trans clinic. You know, it's like people were, you know, the, the uh, people who were involved in legal advocacy work, like we're starting to help trans people change names on identity documents. Trans people were able to access job training programs through, um, you know, through the, mm -hmm. the, the EEOC, and you know, workforce development funding. So it, you know, it, it was a, a dramatic sort of flare up mm -hmm. that then produced some structural changes. And then I think that the trigger for those changes, they was forgotten, you know, for, for a variety of reasons, but that I, I do see, I mean, like, uh, unlike Cooper donut, which you, you mentioned, it's like a very similar kind of event, you know, a late night hangout for street active people who were, you know, queer or trans and, and, um, you know, would draw police attention. Apparently one of the um, the triggers at the Cooper Donut riot is that police were asking for people's IDs, and you know a lot of you know a lot of gender non-conforming people had an or trans people would have an appearance that did not match their state issued ID, and that would be something that would like trigger their further involvement with the you know police power structure, and they fought back. They fought back one you know one one night, but it didn't really go anywhere after that. You know, it was just like something got out of hand. Queer folks fought back against the police, ran off into the night. And then that was it. With 
Compton's, I do think there was there was a structural change that took place afterwards, partly because of the organizing that was going on. It's like that that activist communities and neighborhood residents and you know LG and T people were were ready. You know, they were ready to do something. They were organized in a way that allowed the the pushback to actually like move them a little further down the road. Yeah. So the million dollar question that you asked earlier, why does everyone remember Stonewall? And until you brought it back up, you know, Compton's had just sort of disappeared. Yeah. Well, you know, in, gosh, when would that be? Um, 1995, 1994, on the 25th anniversary of Stonewall, the you know, eminent gay historian Martin Duberman, you know, who wrote a book on Stonewall was being interviewed in the Harvard Gay and Lesbian Review and was asked that question about like, why the mythologizing of Stonewall? And he says, well, you know, that's, you know, people are always looking for like some, you know, myth, you know, like why Bastille Day, you know, like for all like the French Revolution. And he said, you know, there were a number of other, you know, moments of militancy before Stonewall. And including the Compton's cafeteria riot uh, in San Francisco, just like why we remember Stonewall and not Compton's is a bit of a mystery, mostly because I think it happened on the West Coast. That was his take on it. And, you know, all Duberman really knew was the same things that I knew when I started out. It's like he knew there was that one document at the historical society that suggested there was something that happened at Compton's cafeteria, but he'd never done any research on it. So that was actually one of the things that led me to go like, yeah, well, like if Marty Duberman knows about this, but doesn't know anything more than what I know, it's like, this would be like a great thing to like dig into a little bit more. I think one of the other, um, so, I mean, you know, a, a number of things, you know, one of them was like, I, I, I think Compton's happened a little too early at some some level, you know, that it was right at the beginning of the war in Vietnam. It was right at the beginning of the youth counterculture. It was right at the, you know, it's like, I think of it as like, by, by the time uh, Stonewall comes along, there's a lot more combustible material. There's been like three years of, you know, activism, three years of movement building, the feminist movements in a different place, you know, the black power struggle has really come into its own. Black Panthers were formed in Oakland in 1966, right at the same time as the Compton's cafeteria riot, you know, they were just getting started. And I just think that, that by 1969, there were a bunch of queer people who were kind of saying like, you know, it's like, it's time for our revolution. You know, and then when Stonewall happens, you know, boom, they're like, this is it, you know, to the barricades, comrade. You know, this is what we're going to organize around. Uh, and in 1966, it just wasn't there yet. So, you know, it was like same spark, but like different amount of kindling and combustible material. So just Stonewall was bigger. And also, you know, it's like San Francisco is a pretty small place, ultimately. You know, it is a small city. New York is huge. There were more people there. It's like New York is the media capital of the world. And it's like the Stonewall was down the street from the Village Voice. You know, the New York Times was covering it. Uh, you know, so, you know, it's kind of like when something happens in San Francisco, it happens in San Francisco. And when something happens in New York, it's like the world shall know. <laughs> so I think that was part of it. The other piece, I think, is that... Um, kind of the 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 keeper of the flame bearer of the torch for the Compton's cafeteria riot memory was this guy Raymond Brochiers who was a, a a gay activist he was actually a, a minister he did a lot of social justice street ministry had sort of like street church kind of stuff he he was the person who it was in the tenderloin he hung out at Compton's he knew about what went on there and that he was the organizer for that um, 1972 gay pride parade where he told the story of Compton's. 
but most people in the organized gay and lesbian community in San Francisco would not give Ray brochures the time of day. You know, it's like it was that same kind of like radical versus respectability politics. Also, brochures was a famously uh, difficult person. I think uh, the way I read it, he he actually had a really serious gay bashing incident in the later 50s and had a traumatic brain injury. And, you know, I really think that some of um, Brochier's um, emotional lability, you know, and and his um, like sudden bursts of, you know, aggression. It's like, I, you know, to me, it sounds a lot like a, you know, front, frontal lobe injury, but Brochier's was uh, not widely beloved by, by many people. And actually the next year, 1973, more, I would say, respectability-oriented gays organized what they thought was the first Pride Parade in San Francisco, and they kind of like sidelined what Ray Brochiers had done the year before, and they there was sort of a, a famous story in San Francisco about how Brochiers said that there was to be no violence, it was a nonviolent march, and then there was a uh, a kind of a lesbian separatist um, group who showed up to march carrying these signs that said off the pricks and that Ray decided that that constituted an act of violence because they, they were advocating violence towards pricks and that he tried to prevent them from marching and they said, no, we're going to march. And then he tried to take the signs away from them and they wouldn't give him the signs. And he wound up in a fist fight with a bunch of lesbian separatists and that was the, you know, it's like every, all of the other activists in town was like, that's it. Like we're done with Ray, you know, next year, you know, Ray's not involved. And they also, you know, they excluded trans people from the march. It's like they were, it was more like the Castro oriented gays rather than like the tenderloin oriented street hustling, sex work and young unhoused gender variant crowd. And, and so the community-based and cultural mechanisms for remembering Compton's got, you know, they, they got disarticulated from the event, you know, just like they, the, the, the history that the official, you know, gay culture was remembering was not the Compton's history. It's like the people who were remembering that, who were part of that community were not enfolded into the gay and lesbian community that took shape in the 1970s and, you know, moved increasingly into, you know, the, the liberal power structure of the city, you know, the Harvey milks of the world. Um, and so, you know, I, I see Compton's being forgotten largely because a much more radical and diverse movement in the sixties got narrowed down into something that was, you know, mostly white, mostly cis, mostly, you know, li liberal inclusionist rather than like radically, like structurally transformational. And people forgot about Compton's until some, you know, unemployed tranny historian with a PhD is like looking for something to do. And I, you know, found this great story. Yeah. And it, it is a terrific story. So tell people how they can watch the film. We have a website, uh, ScreamingQueensMovie.com, that will tell you where you can access all of the uh, streaming options. It, it, was, um, it was a film that was funded by ITVS, which um, works with independent media producers to develop content for public television. You know, we have had a national uh, broadcast, but, you know, like that was mm. almost 20 years ago. The film came out in 1995. Uh, it's been in distribution ever since um, it's available for and increasingly it's like everything has sort of moved into streaming platforms. And so you can watch it on Canopy, which is available to a, a lot of public libraries and universities. It's available on Amazon Prime. And if you have an Amazon Prime account, it's part of the free streaming content that you can access it streams on the uh, YouTube channel of our local PBS affiliate, uh, KQED. Uh, and, you know, if you're interested, you can buy a, you know, DVD or Blu-ray or, you know, 
download a digital file. But so screamingqueensmovie.com, it will tell you all of the different ways you can access the film. But it's out there. It's pretty easy to find. Just Google it. You'll find it. Yeah. And I'll put a link in the show notes uh, to, to the movie website uh, and, and to your book as well, Transgender History, uh, where you talk some about this event too and, and provide some context. Thank you so much for joining me. Uh, this was, it's just a terrific story and I, I'm so thrilled to have learned about it and I, I really appreciate your time. And I appreciate your time. And it sounds like you've got a great lineup of programs for the whole month of June. So uh, I'm happy to be happy to be part of it. Thanks for listening to Unsung History. You can find the sources used for this episode at unsunghistorypodcast.com. To the best of our knowledge, all audio and images used by Unsung History are in the public domain or are used with permission. You can find us on Twitter or Instagram at unsung underscore underscore history or on Facebook at Unsung History Podcast. To contact us with questions or episode suggestions, please email kelly at unsunghistorypodcast.com. If you enjoyed this podcast, please rate and review and tell your friends.